The Umpire Inspire podcast is all about the stories, all about the journeys, and all about the heart of being an umpire. I'm your host, Jason Becker. Hey everybody, Jason here. I hope y'all have had a great week since we visited last, and as always, I thank you so much for tuning in today. It's a lot of fun for me to bring these great umpires to your listening ears. Hey, email me at jason at umpireinspire.com and let me know how you like the show. And visit umpireinspire.com to listen to all my conversations with these awesome umpires from Little League to high school, college, NCAA, and the minor leagues, and all the way up to the big leagues. At umpireinspire.com, you can also find out how you can become a contributor to the podcast, part of the Umpire Inspire crew by supporting Umpire Inspire on Patreon. And I'll have more to share about that at the back end of the show today. Well, on today's show, I'm excited to introduce you to my friend, Brian Herzog. Brian spent nine years in the minor leagues up until the end of his journey in 2014. Nine years, he had a good solid run. Good solid run through the minors. Uh, Worked some big games, had the very good fortune to work with a ton of great umpires, many of whom are now in the major leagues. Along with just the story of Brian's journey through the minor leagues, there are two very specific aspects of his minor league career that we talk about in our conversation today. One is his experience working in Venezuela in the off season between his promotion from double A to triple A. Uh, quite a unique environment, as you'll hear, and uh, one that did a whole lot of good for Brian's game in some pretty interesting ways. And the second specific thing we talk about is actually the end of Brian's career in minor league baseball. You know, Brian didn't get the call to the big leagues, and he was very kind and very generous to share what that really felt like for him. I think you're going to really appreciate his thoughts on that part of his umpiring career. So do please enjoy my visit with Brian Herzog. Brian, my friend, welcome to the Umpire Inspire podcast. How are you today? Doing pretty good, buddy. It's a little drippy here in the Pacific Northwest. It is. Where we both live. Uh, Nevertheless, I sure wish I had a game to go do today, but uh, in good time, right? Yeah. I would really be interested, and I think our listeners will love to hear about your experience as a minor league umpire. You've got a great story, and... um, and and it's going to be very cool to dive into some of the details and a little bit about your journey there. Pick up your story in 2006, okay? Yeah. You have just graduated from the Jim Evans Academy. You've been offered a job in minor league baseball. Um, and you begin what ends up becoming a nine-year run in minor league baseball. Can you uh, just give me the broad strokes of... Um, of your journey through the minors, some of the different leagues you worked in, and uh, just uh, let's just start there. Tell us a couple stories. Yeah, well, after after three years of umpiring high school ball here in in uh, Washington, uh, I spent nine years in the minor leagues and uh, three each in A ball, double uh, A and triple A, and uh, they're all kind of different. Uh, a ball consists of multiple different leagues, so I spent time in the Pioneer League. Uh, I skipped over rookie ball that year, uh, which we will actually get back to later because that's something I, I wish I would have had that extra experience. But I uh, started in the Pioneer League, uh, which is short season A, kind of the same here as far as umpires go, the same as right here in uh, in Everett for the Aqua Sox uh, for the Northwest League. But So it was a Pioneer League, and my second year was the South Atlantic League after spending a little time at extended spring training um, after getting my first spring training under my belt. And then the third year I was in the California league and my partner was from right up here in Washington too, uh, in West Seattle, Dan Oliver. So, um, that was, those are all the three levels of a ball and they, I mean, they each, each league has its own stories for you and your your own memories, you know, um, uh, you know, in the, in the California league and then the next year in the Texas league too, I, I worked with Danny two years in a row, California league, Texas league. You're with, uh, you're with Danny, both of those, yes. uh, both of those leagues. 
And you've also, you know, in, in those next few years, you pick up uh, Instructional League, Venezuela, and of course, finally, the Pacific Coast League for a few years. Um, yeah. I'd like to hear a little bit about those last two stops you made, but looking back over your entire minor league experience, it, it's not quite right to ask what your favorite was, but I imagine mm-hmm. the experience in each one of those leagues was a little different in some ways. And um, did you enjoy or appreciate uh, the experience at any particular stop along the way any more than any other? Um, any more than any other. That's uh, yeah. That, and that's a good way to phrase it. Cause I, I don't know that any more than any other, not really, because there, there's just such unique things about each league, you know, sure. um, uh, unlike a vault, you know, the text double a, you just stay in one league for three years. There's only three double a leagues. So you're going to the Texas league, the Southern league or the Eastern league. Um, so I, you know, and then you work up at, cause you also move from the two umpire man system to the three umpire man system. So you work typically as a low man learning from, uh, you know, the other two guys that have had a little more three man experience. And then, uh, you know, you're kind of the two man on the crew and then you act a year as a crew chief before moving on. And then in between double A and triple A, uh, is when Venezuela, uh, happened, uh, uh, for me. So that was in between, so that was the 2011 and 12 season. So, um, you know, I, Venezuela does, does hold highlights, I guess for me, like it's a, it's a very much glad I went, glad I'm back type of thing. Cause you just can't right. believe some of the stories that come out of Venezuela. Um, is it, uh, may I ask, is it your, is it an umpire's choice to get additional work down in Venezuela or is that something that you're assigned to? Well, at yeah, that the, level? the goal around that, that time is to then start getting some four man experience. You know, if I can get uh, okay. some four, four man experience down to Venezuela, Manny Gonzalez is a MLB umpire. And the year I worked down there, he had just gotten a full-time rover position meaning he's not just going up and down um, randomly and, and, and assigned to a minor league, a triple A crew. He has a full-time rover position and will now most likely see very little triple A work. So it was a big, a big move for him. Right. And, uh, and then my crew chief, Carlos Torres, you know, is also now a full-time MLB umpire. So, you know, the guys I got to work with down there, these guys learned to umpire under those crazy situations that I look back and go, holy crap, that, absolutely um you know change the way I umpire and just make like you come back from that type of you know 35,000 people because this is a a Yankees Red Sox type matchup down here in Venezuela this okay. is their big leagues and then coming back it's just like this isn't hard at all like your, your adrenaline is just not anywhere near to where it was working in those situations and that's um you know that that's how working higher and higher kind of calibrates your your adrenaline in, in certain situations to help you stay calm and see the situation kind of in real time for what it is because yeah. as soon as that adrenaline starts going everything starts speeding up uh, we all know the timing is everything for umpires and um you know that's you know when 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 your instructor you know beats into you timing 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 it's really not it's really more and i don't think we understand this as umpires it's really much more than we and we see on the surface of that comment as, you know, my timing behind the plate, my, my timing to make sure uh, I heard that correctly. The, the ball beat, you know, the runner's foot to the base, stuff like that. It's also uh, comes down to the heat of the moment situations. And, and, you know, did you blurt out what you what you thought in your head and wanted to say, but mm-hmm. shouldn't have said during that situation? Yeah. So that's why timing, timing, timing comes down to just everything. Yeah. Is that sort of what you meant by? Um, when you said the Venezuela experience changed the way you umpire, um, sounds like it wasn't necessarily from a mechanical standpoint, but more so from managing the game and managing your place within the game. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it just, you know, there, there is, uh, I expected to actually encounter more fights, you know, and there's value in, in, in encountering brawls. And then knowing how to handle them later, obviously. But, um, I only saw one in the playoffs and, um, do you feel like you were prepared for that or when you got down there, was that still the just, well, just the, just the atmosphere. Um, were you, were you told about what the atmosphere might be like? Were you prepared for it as best as you could or, or did it, did it take you back a bit? It took me back a bit. Absolutely. Nothing can really prepare you for, for what goes on down there. Uh, but I, I did try and prepare myself, you know, from previous uh, partners, Jeff Gosney, 
uh, you know, now uh, huge on the NCAA circuit. And he got a good amount of, of MLB time too. Uh, after getting a number, my, uh, my last game was with him actually, uh, my last professional game. Uh, but I, I did pick his brain a bit about uh, all the different cities and, and kind of a little bit about what to expect, but you know, nothing really, uh, <laughs> can prepare you for, <laughs> right. for, for what goes on down there. Like it's, uh, you know, nine inning games lasting four and a half hours. Well, Venezuela is quite the, quite the crucible, I guess, to describe it one way to, uh, to toughen yeah. you up and to, and to strengthen you in certain areas exactly with certain skills to get you back to, uh, to the United States and work in pro ball back here. So that takes you into, uh, directly into triple a, is that right? After your Venezuela experience? Yeah, actually I got, um, when I got back to the States, I had a message from, uh, from the PCL Pacific coast league office, uh, from Dwight who handles, uh, everything. He's Branch Rickey's right hand man. Branch Rickey's that uh, uh, league president in the Pacific Coast League. So I had a message to give him a call. Uh, called, talked with him. He gave me my crew. Called and talked to the crew chief, and it just kind of happened that fast. Uh, I had my crew, had my promotion. So that's a nice welcome back for you. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> we we got our rankings when we were down there, so it's like we could follow a little bit what was going on based on if your you know your friend was ranked close to you and just mm-hmm. got promoted or something like that. But you just, you never know exactly when the next right. promotion is coming. So, right. so it was really nice. And I, so yeah, I, got, I went right into AAA from there and then, and then actually that next spring training. So before I worked my first AAA game, actually, I got my first, um, big league spring training game. Um, let's see in 2012. And, uh, so that was pretty fun to get a couple of spring training games out of, uh, right out of my Venezuela experience. They really liked a lot of the uh, a lot of what they heard from Venezuela. So then I, I suppose that was kind of the reward from that. But yeah, uh, really great experiences. The first one was with uh, Ben May and, and Angel Campos. And, uh, you know, Angel's one of those guys with over 500, maybe over 600 games. But I know at least over 500 games in the big leagues. And, um, you know, he's one of those that I think should have been hired. Uh, just me personally. And uh, and then Ben May, who's who's still going, he's right behind. Uh, Sean Barber as far as uh, the amount of MLB games worked uh, so hopefully he's gonna get a job in the next couple couple of years here that'd be really nice to see yeah yeah what was your approach going into that first set of major league spring training games did you feel pretty confident or in hindsight did you feel like uh, the moment got to you at all um, how was your work I, I felt pretty confident just because I was right off the heels of Venezuela. Um, and I, and I really felt like I, I, I worked, you know, Venezuela and, and the, the, the timing of that. So when you work a, a winter ball year, you're, you're taking your six month season. And for me, that was 2011 in the Texas league. And then your next six month season, and that was going to be 2012 in the, in the Pacific coast league. And you're taking this, the six months in the middle and going, I'm going to give four of them away to be out of the country type of thing. So it's, it's really a lot of baseball in that 18 month period, um, where I had, I think eight weeks total at, at home. And even of those eight weeks at home, that just means with family, there was actually some, a couple of weeks of travel with family too. So it, it was just busy all around. Uh, but coming right off of the heels, so I may, I think maybe two weeks or let's see, January, uh, a few, you know, a few weeks after Venezuela, I was still feeling pretty like that was some serious, stuff like my last game in venezuela was the championship game you know there's 35 thousand fans i never trust their box scores but 35 ish thousand fans and i'm kind of scared working the right field line because they're literally (laughs) half they're they're literally halfway over hanging you know hanging on like this last out that's about to happen and i'm eyeballing the tunnel that I get to have to go through, it's just to my left. Thank God I'm not working the, the left field line. I'm working the right field line. But, you know, like that kind of crazy, you know, experience. Um, and then I worked one one or maybe two minor league spring training games with my crew before I got that first game. Yeah. But, it, you know, it, it just, I guess, compared, you know, getting down to it, it's just compared to uh, Venezuela. It just wasn't that... Uh, it wasn't that fast a baseball because there it's such great baseball down there too. 
and uh, and then working with guys like you know uh, you know Ben May and, and Angel Compost doesn't doesn't suck one bit. Yeah, that's right. They definitely know what they're doing. If anything, just at the time, um, you know, we were completely lost as far as working three men um, because that's definitely Angel works mostly four men. Uh, ben had already been working. Um, he had just come from Florida. He had already got a good amount of MLB spring under his belt actually that year. And then I was just coming off of Venezuela where I yeah. you know worked. 70 80 you know four man games myself so you all you all had to reacquaint yourself yeah yeah exactly <laughs> what kind of an umpire did you become during those three years in triple a can you think back to the brian herzog that started in triple a versus um who brian herzog was when you wrapped up your triple a experience what were some of the differences between that guy at the beginning and the guy at the end yeah, that changed. Uh, that changed a lot for me for I guess a couple of reasons. One, I I always felt that uh, you know the year I got in in two thousand six was a year that there it was a strike year for the minor leagues uh, because of you know some some of the guys being unhappy after uh, after the union you know it settled on the on the new CBA. Uh, there was it, it was going to be a feast or famine year. You know if you if you didn't uh, if the union didn't settle then it was just going to be as if you went to umpire school and didn't earn a job any other way. And you would have had to start over, go to umpire school again. Uh, if they settled, they had some guys and this is what ended up happening. You had some guys that weren't happy and there was more turnover than normal. So, um, I, that, that is why I skipped rookie ball. I would have really loved to have that extra experience just in rookie ball, a much more lower key setting. Um, because I, f- I feel both in double A AA and triple A that I was there about a year early and I would have just liked to have that extra year of experience oh, okay. under my belt, you know? And, um, and I, and I say that to guys here too, that I evaluate it. it it's not always, some guys get, uh, you know, down when you, when I, cause I do some evaluations locally, uh, some guys get down maybe when, when they don't get, uh, I guess, put up for a promotion to the next level. It, it doesn't mean necessarily that, that you can't handle that next level of ball. It just means that a tiny bit more experience under your belt will help you handle that level of ball when you get there. This is sort of a recurring theme for me right now, Brian, hearing you say yeah. this. I've also read this in a couple of recent books and articles that I've read um, is the tendency of some umpires to just always be pushing forward for the next thing to get yeah. to that next level as fast as possible. And, yeah. um, and there's nothing wrong with that drive. Right, right. Absolutely. But, there's, but there's value often in just uh, settling into where you're at and getting some more seasoning and just becoming rock solid on the things yeah. that you've got to be rock solid on. Um, yeah. And I, and, I say that, and I say that having only worked, you know, three years of high school baseball uh, before I went to umpire school and, and me personally feeling like that was about the right amount. You know, they, they, they do say, Hey, you can come with zero experience because you have zero bad habits. So I, you know, I think to, somewhere between two and four years is, is probably a, a good amount to have under your belt if you're looking to go to umpire school. So when you, when you started that first AAA season, were you thinking this back then too? Were you thinking to yourself, ah, oh, you know, I'm not quite sure if I'm ready for this. I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have had that experience. Um, or was that really not a factor? I, no, I think I was a little too naive at the time. Um, and again, yeah. on the heels of Venezuela, so a little naive thinking, you know, like I got this. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I can I'm handle this type of thing. You know what I mean? Um, and, uh, and, 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 to and, a, typically, and to a point, that's that's true, right? I mean, after after such a long period of work and then coming right off Venezuela, you were at the top of your game in, in some ways. Stepping yeah, right I, into I mean, I, and it's and it, it's like you know, when it's your winter ball year and some people do multiple Sean, we already mentioned Sean Barber. He, he has done multiple. Um, in fact, when, uh, and when, when trip got his big league call, uh, he was down to the Dominican and, uh, they bring you home once they give you that, that, that big league call. And, uh, and Sean went down and took his, <laughs> took his spot in the Dominican. So oh, Sean okay. did a couple, but, um, but yeah, it's just like you, you've just finished, the second leg of a three leg race type of thing. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, mm-hmm. it, and I, and I speak so much about like the first year of getting to double A and the first year of getting to triple A specifically, because that's when you really want to be ready. Even though, 
you know, AAA is in theory three years long for you because, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about the retention policy later. Um, but uh, essentially, you have three years to get to what what would the next level would be for you is getting the fall league, and then uh, Arizona fall league, and then from there being assigned a full big league spring training, and from there being assigned a big league number. And from there, getting your very first phone call, you heard, you heard about that, uh, in, in your story from trip, you know, I I remember that, I remember that story very well. Yeah. Um, there's just so much, um, you know, some people in, in hearing that, you know, I got, like I was, I was blessed to get just a baker's dozen, uh, MLB spring training games, not Uh regular season, not anything like, you know, just enough to go over one with an ejection. Um, not, (laughs) not related, but you know, but there's just so much space, I guess, in between where I was and then, um, you know, where, where, what it took to get to where trip is that I guess there's, there's such a respect for, I guess, understanding that, you know, um, I, like I just did a webinar with BBF, uh, British baseball federation. We talked about plays of the plate and I use an example with DJ Rayburn, uh, DJ Rayburn was my, my instructor at umpire school. And I remember him getting uh, promoted to triple a while I was there when I was in the pioneer league, I got to see him work in Salt Lake city when I was in a neighboring, uh, a ball city. And, um, and then when I got to triple a, I had the opportunity to work with him a little bit. And then my last year in minor league baseball, he was finally hired full time to the big league staff. So that's just, I guess the respect is I'm understanding that it's at some times it's a complete career on top of the career that I had to get to where they are. And it's just while, while triple a and, and getting to work a few big league spring games looks so close to, to being a major league umpire. It's a whole career just to become a major on top of that, just to become a major league umpire. And it's just interesting. Um, you know, it's, it just, it, it just kind of puts it in perspective, yeah, when, I guess. When, when I hear stories like this from you and some, from some other minor league umpires, I, I I'm, I'm getting that sense that, uh, to take that final step, that last leg of the journey, like you just described it. I mean, it is truly the best of the best of the best of the best. Um, yeah. That, that persevere. Now, now you're, yeah. Now you're fighting with the top 1% of the top 1% yeah, to, yeah, to, yeah. you know, for, for jobs at the, at the highest levels. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple more questions for you, Brian, on, on the minor league experience here. Um, you've, you've mentioned a few, um, big league umpires, some names that uh, we all recognize. And I imagine that you had the opportunity to work on the field with some outstanding umpires uh, Mm -hmm. coming up through minor league baseball during your nine years working there. Can you tell me about a few that you most admire or maybe that you really just really enjoyed working with, Uh, whether they're MLB guys now or otherwise, who are, who are just a couple of those, those people that come to mind? Yeah, well, I, I have very fortunate to be able to work with somewhere right now, just because there was a bunch of new hires, somewhere between probably 25 and 30 uh, of the current MLB staff of 76, I think it is right now. Um, you know, and part of that's because, I mean, 2006 was a really strong class. Uh, there's a lot of 2006 hires, and I happened to, you know, go to umpire school with a lot of those guys. And, and then we just ended up coming up together. Um, and also because of, you know, when replay opened, uh, it, that opened up eight more jobs to the staff. So we saw a lot more hires than, than normal. So uh, I was just very fortunate to, to be able to work with a lot of guys, uh, and glean a lot of information from a lot of those guys. And it's really just, um, part of it's just the luck of, you know, the timing of when I came up yeah. um, and when I got certain games, but, uh, you know, Ted Barrett's always at the top of the list, uh, because just from the, just from the beginning, um, you know, he, he led a Bible study at, uh, at umpire school and because I'm so horrible with names, I mean, I remembered his name, but like <laughs> what I'm getting to is I'm so horrible with names. And when I finally, you know, and after just a single Bible study saying, hi, hi, I'm Brian, you know, met, I mean, couldn't have talked for more than 30 seconds. Um, when I was finally hired and, you know, went to my first spring training and then there was always, uh, uh, there was always one one get together at at Teddy's house every year, and that's just that was one of the basically the two days that you had to do. Uh, you know, e- every crew was was going there. You know, uh, excuse me, every man on every crew was 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 showing up. 
And, uh, you know, the first time I saw him there at his own house, you know, it was, you know, Hey Brian, how are you doing? And it's like, oh man, you, you didn't even know at the time that you met me that I would be hired as an umpire. But you, you like, you know, like you had no reason to go, Hey, remember this guy's name? He like, it was just, I was, you know, one of 120 guys or so at the time, um, who, who you met over the course of a few days uh, at umpire school, but such a small thing, but something that says so much about a guy, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, that's the thing. It was just like, I just sold from there. Like as far as he genuinely cares about the people he meets. Um, who are a couple other guys that you had a chance to work with that, uh, you really remember really fondly that helped you along or that you really admired? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I got one chance to work just to go right to the top. I got one chance to work with Joe West, uh, which was a pretty cool experience and there's no chance he would remember working with me because it was just a kind of a rehab assignment for him. <laughs> um, so that was fun, uh, in, you know, in that I could just say that I've, I worked a game with him, you know. Yeah, and, cool. But that was fun. But that that year specifically was was with Drift Gibson, and so to embarrass him a little more, he he he's the one I absolutely look up to as far as umpiring and just uh, you know the amount of information I was able to glean that season was just amazing. Yeah, so cool. Um, I did. If you're comfortable talking about it, I I did want to ask you about the end. You know, you worked three solid years in AAA, and uh, that was. Uh, that was the conclusion of your of your uh, pro baseball um, career. Um, you didn't get the call, right? And Correct. I just I wonder if you could share a little bit about what that was like. You know, we we all know that at that point, it's the one percent of the one percent of the one percent who are going to get that call, and so. I mean, golly, you can't feel too bad about the great and, you know, decorated career that you had in the minors. But um, walk me through what happened there and and uh, what your experience was like when you realized, you know, that that uh, you were going to be wrapping it up. Yeah, no problem. It's it's actually something that's kind of always looming over your head or, or at least yeah. like every thir- every third year or so. Because uh, the retention policy uh, in in our collective bargaining bargaining agreement says that uh, you essentially have three years to move across every level, um, you know. So essentially, every third year or so, two or three years, it it can kind of loom over your head based on, um, you know, you get rankings twice a year in uh, in A ball and double A, so you kind of know where you where you rank and. Uh, over those three years in double A, how have you moved up? There's 45 umpires in double A. So how have you moved up uh, from number 45 when you just joined to, you know, hopefully in the top five so you can move to triple A. So you kind of always have a have a feel of, of whether you might be released at the end of a level, I guess. Right. Uh, or whether you have a chance to go on to the next one. So. And and obviously the higher you go, the the, the bottleneck just continues to get um, smaller, um, and not everyone can fit through. So uh, that's one reason that I said that I really kind of felt on the front end of my career I would have loved to to spend a year in rookie ball because when you're in AAA you're no longer evaluated and get the same reports and evaluators as you did in AA and A ball. And when you get to AAA, they are expecting you to be ready to be now just groomed for the big leagues. So really ideally you're looking to get Arizona fall league out of your first year at AAA. So that's why I, I say going back to even so at that point, you know, six or so years earlier, if I would have gone to the rookie ball and, and I would have had more experience in my first year in AAA, there's a higher chance that, that maybe I could have gotten fall league out of there. But so once, once I didn't get it after my year with, with a uh, trip in 2013, uh, you know, I kind of figured 2014 was probably my last season. Uh, you know, it's, there's typically, uh, well, probably eight to somewhere six to 10, I guess, releases from AAA a year, uh, depending on the year. Uh, but you know, in, in being a crew chief, there's also some stuff with the uh, Pacific coast league. Uh, you choose, uh, I guess the top four crew chiefs would choose whether they want to work the all-star game or the triple a national championship at the end of the year. So, uh, 
I chose to go, you know, I, this very likely could be my last year. Uh, we've had some wonderful experiences. I'm going to, um, uh, crew chief the playoffs all the way through for the Pacific coast league, all the way through to the end and then choose the AAA national championship. And then I work for the the AAA national championship as my last professional game. So I did all this not knowing, but you know, very likely uh, understanding that that could have been my last game because the, the actual phone calls don't come until the end of October. So, um, I just kind of went, you know what, let's go out with a bang and, and, um, just, it it was, so we, so we planned it from the get go and, and we planned to have my, you know, my wife there and she got a lot of, uh, a lot of those experiences in the middle as well. Obviously she got to spend a month with me down in Venezuela, uh, which is just, you know, great to, that she could take that much time off of work and, and be down there. So it sounds to me like, uh, you were in a pretty good place just in your umpire soul that last year, you know, you had, a, yeah. you had a clear understanding that, uh, man, I've had, a, I've had a great run. I've given this everything I've got. Um, it's going to work yeah. out or it's not going to work out either way. Let's go work some games. Let's go work hard. And, uh, and, uh, just appreciate it for what it was. And it sounds like you ended up in a pretty good place. Yeah, I was, it, you know, it, it's, and, and, it, and it is such a good question really, because I would often, describe my attitude in the minor leagues as I'm trying, I'm, I'm going to work hard to make them release me versus, you know, like first of all, doing something myself on or off the field that could get me released, but also versus hanging it up early, like, which is, you know, like situations change in life and, and some, you know, some guys hang it up earlier because it's just not the life they wanted or their situation change as far as a kid or another job offer or something. But my goal was to, I, I told people to make them release me. I wanted to go as far as I can and make them release me and tell me when I've reached my peak, you know. Good for you. So you gave it everything you've got and no regrets. That's really good to hear. Yeah. So that phone call, that phone call at the end of that year just ended up, you know, it was, it was, you know, as formal as, as you'd expect it to be. Uh, you know, God bless Dusty Dillinger at, with minor league baseball for having to make those, uh, you know, that role can't be an easy job during that time. But, uh, you know, when I was driving to work that day and I saw his name on the phone, I knew exactly what was what was happening, you know. So, yeah. You know, let's just wrap it up right there. I, I definitely thank you for your time. Um, I think we I feel like we barely scratched the surface of what I would like to hear from you about your minor league career. So, uh, buddy, I think you and I are going to have to uh, get together for beers again. Uh, sometime soon Glad to. and uh, I'll get to ask you the rest of the questions there well hang in there pal and uh, all the best to you and Bonnie and um, I'm sure we'll see you guys soon okay absolutely all right thanks Brian thanks brother well there you have it for today thank you so much for listening the minor league baseball experience is so interesting to me so many good people there good people and great umpires. I was um, particularly happy, maybe you were too, to hear that the conclusion of Brian's time as a minor league umpire seemed to be a good one for him, a healthy one. The uh, end of the road, you know, that's not a part of the journey we think about or talk about too much. But look, it's the reality for 99% of the umpires who chase that dream. So I really thank Brian again for sharing that with us. That was very cool. All right, before we wrap up today's show, I want to be sure to send my sincere thanks out to listeners Anne Ivan, John Coney, and Jacqueline Benoit, who supported the show this week by becoming contributors at Patreon. As you know, this show is listener-supported. And not just the show, but a number of other efforts underway at Umpire Inspire, all to celebrate and inspire baseball and softball umpires around the world. If uh, you enjoy this podcast and you'd like to find out how you can help support the show, how you can help build Umpire Inspire, uh, learn about the rewards you can earn, and all of this for as little as $3 a month towards something that you enjoy and a mission you can get behind, then please do visit umpireinspire.com support and you can find out all the details. Hey, have a terrific week. 
take very good care of yourselves, and I will see you next week on the Umpire Inspire podcast. Mm-hmm.